the topic of international migration is very closely linked to the topic of international inequality, right? I mean, if you flee war, if you flee conflict, you flee violence, right? But the majority of migration is by people who seek better opportunities. So we need to talk about inequality because the idea of labor migration is to move from a place of little opportunity to larger opportunity, right? And we do know, we've learned that the big bang of industrialization is at the core of global inequalities, right? So it was in the 19th century, or maybe a little bit before, that Europe, that the West really took off through industrialization, through modern capitalism. And this great divergence is at the heart still of global inequalities. And here I am relying on the writings by Branko Milanovic, who we've encountered in uh, all of my classes a few times. So this is the great divergence. Now, globalization, or what some call neoliberalism, in the recent decades has not led to greater convergence, at least not between the poor and the, the rich parts of the world. Capital tends to flow between rich countries and technological catch-up is hard when rich countries protect their technologies. Right? So globalization has not made the world more equal. The equalization that has taken place is via the rise of China, which has reduced global inequalities to some extent, uh, actually to you know quite a substantial uh, extent, and the rise of India, right? And then also other um, Asian developers. But really, the rise of China is is fundamental to the reduction in global inequality that does exist. More on that later. Now, there's a really interesting finding in the field of inequality studies, and that is that citizenship is in fact the major factor determining your income levels, right? So it's where you are in the world of nation states, not where you are within your country in terms of class, that determines how much you will have. What does it mean? Basically, a person that is well off in Tanzania would be rather poor when measured against income levels, of course, purchasing power parity um, adjusted in the US, right? So basically, well off people in poorer countries, you know, not making it towards, you know, the level of poorer country, poorer people in, in richer countries, right? So it's not your position within the national class system, but your position uh, within the world of nation states that is most determinant of your income, the biggest predictor of your income. And citizenship, of course, is a form of fate. You know, there's nothing you can do about your citizenship. Another really important factor determining how much you will earn is who your parents are. What connections do they have? What networks? What are they giving you? What in terms of education? What terms of capital? Right? That is also important. The most important, however, is citizenship. And that means that hard work will only get you so far because your place of birth is so important for your income level. Let's look at this graph. It's a little bit complicated and the calculations behind are nothing that I would want to <laughs> endeavor to do. This is taken from Branko Milanovic's book called uh, Global Inequality that you see uh, here. So this graph, back to the graph. This graph shows the share of between country uh, inequality and global inequality. Global inequality is basically inequality within countries plus the inequality between countries, right? So these two in country and between country inequality, they make up global inequality, right? And as you can see here from this graph in Milanovic, from the 19th century onwards until uh, the, the late 20th century, um, global inequality or inequality between countries was constantly rising and became the biggest part of uh, global inequality, right? I mean, look at the time before industrialization. Before industrialization, inequalities between countries weren't really high because most countries operated on subsistence 
subsistence levels, right? And maybe double the subsistence level, but not much more than that. It's through industrialization, through modern capitalism, that real wealth becomes possible, real abundance, right? And that shows in that graph. I mean, that graph tells the economic history and in doing so, the history of our world. It shows the great divergence from the 19th century until today. Now, recently, there has been a slight move downwards in terms of the proportion of between country inequality within global inequality, right? And why is that? As I said, because China got richer, right? Lifting millions out of poverty, um, making a country of more than a billion people grow, that means a reduction in global inequality by definition. Now, the question is, to what extent the story will go on? If all late developers, of course, catch up with the rich countries, that would mean we would revert back to a world where class was more important than location, right? Where basically inequality between countries isn't as important as the inequality within countries, right? And Milanovic calls that from Marx to Fanon and back, right? Remember Marx or Ricardo or other economists, they talked about the capitalists and the workers and to some extent the landowners, right? As the people who, you know, make up the economy and who divide the goods, the richness, the wealth in the economy, right? Fanon takes this um, you know, contradiction between capital and worker and replaces it with the contradiction between, or the dichotomy, sorry, between colonizer and the colonized, right? So Fanon, you know, he's Marx in the sense that he sees a fundamental struggle moving history forward, but it's not a class struggle, it's the struggle between the colonized and the colonizer. And in terms of global inequality, that was certainly true. I mean, look at this graph. Inequality rises the most in the 20th century and it peaks in the 50s, 60s, right? This is when inequality between countries was highest and that is epitomized, that is shown in the contradiction in the struggle between the colonizer and the colonized, right? Where the colonizer has everything, all the power, and the colonized have none of the power, right? And the idea of Fanon, of course, is to uh, expulse um, the, the, the colonizer and turn this, um, you know, uh, dissolve that, that contradiction, so to say. Okay, but we still live in a more Fanonian than Marxian world in that sense, right? Because inequality between countries exceeds that of within countries when we look at the you know, global number of, or, or, the, or the global issue of inequality, right? So these are some interesting calculations. Now look at this little graph here. It shows you GDP per capita in the US, China and India from the 19th century until recently. And here, you know, you can see the story of divergence and convergence, right? In the 19th century, the US takes off and grows. China and India remain stagnant, but have, you know, risen recently in the economic sense. So the question is, to what extent would this story of convergence go on? If the two most populous countries in the world successfully catch up, then, of course, we see a move away in terms of overall numbers from the Fanonian, maybe back to a more 19th century kind of Marx, Marxian or Ricardian uh, model of the world. Okay, what does all of this have to do with migration? Well, it's simple. Basically, it means that the more inequality there is, the higher the incentive for migration is, right? And that's just a, a basic fact. If you see better opportunity elsewhere, you move, especially if your country remains stuck, if your country remains poor. And this is, of course, the case for you know, a large number of countries in the Middle East and a large number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, too, because it's these countries that make up or that send, involuntarily send, the highest number of migrants to Europe. So how does Europe treat, how does Europe react to that 
kind of influx. Take a look at this map which I took from the International Organization for Migration. And this map tracks the number of migrant deaths in the world. And you can see that, well, first of all, the Mediterranean is the biggest death trap for migrants. Um, but of course, migrants are being deterred, pushed away elsewhere too, between the US and Mexico, uh, many parts of Asia, the Malacca Straits, for example, between Indonesia and Malaysia, and others. But I want to focus on the Mediterranean. So according to the International Organization for Migration, since 2014, about 47,737 migrants have died trying to get into uh, whatever promised land they wanted to get into. This the, the actual number is certainly uh, much higher. Um, out of these roughly 47, 48,000, um, 24,000 migrants have died trying to cross the Mediterranean since 2014. Again, this number is or must be an under-representation. The actual number will be higher because only engaged citizens have an interest in counting the debt, right? I mean, Europe wants to ignore the topic, obviously, because it destroys or at least, say, let's say it contradicts the self-image of an enlightened, an enlightened and human rights abiding West, right? Those states where those migrants come from, in the Middle East, in Sub-Saharan Africa, they also prefer not to know. Why? Because every migrant from Tunisia, from Eritrea, is an indictment of the developmental failure of the states where they're coming from, right? Every migrant that dies in the Mediterranean shows the failure of a state to provide for jobs and to provide for a normal, decent life, right? These are stories of state failures, of states unable to protect their citizens. Especially since the Syrian refugee crisis, the European response to migration has become militarized, and the name for that is Frontex, which is the European Border Guard Agency, a militarized agency that you know, engages in you know, heavy uh, deterrence of migrants. So the, Euro the European response to migration overall is marked by discord among EU members, um, good measure of incompetence uh, by politicians and institutions, and a general uh, disregard um, for the topic, and also marked by the search of uh, the far right, which has pushed um, to the center this idea of a militarized response to migration, the idea of migration as a threat rather than an opportunity.